All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, well, I'm going to give a little bit of a different spin. Uh, really focus on some of the IT priorities, but it has a definite impact on, on where we're going with cybersecurity. So uh, I always talk, one of our key challenges in the Air Force is scale. Um, in, the, in the cybersecurity business, it's all about agility. Agility is always re reverse proportional to scale often. So that's the constant balance we have, certainly the budget challenges that we have, along with the IT priorities and the cybersecurity priorities and balancing all those. In a, in a modernized Air Force that we're trying to get to that we have gone through a lot of years of sequestration, which has really impacted us. So I'm gonna give a couple of impact, uh, areas here around all of our key strategic priorities, right? Cybersecurity isn't just a single fasted domain. Uh, in the Air Force vernacular on the top side, if you look at, this is basically our strategic plan. Operating through, delivering effects, operating through the cyber domain, ensuring our workforce is developed, and then ultimately from a CIO perspective as the deputy CIO, how are we the most efficient for our taxpayers? And so when you look through this, the first two bubbles on the far left, right, when you start talking about initiatives, are really about our air platforms. That's fundamentally where the Air Force flies, fight, and wins from. Um, F-22s, F-35s, F-16s, but more specifically, all the mission systems and logistic systems that support those. So that could be a tactical data link, it could be a maintenance system that uploads uh, air, air planning orders, air tasking orders, um, all those details around our air platforms, we have to ensure are secure, and, all that, and that goes all the way through the maintenance side of it. On the next uh, two aspects here, really how do we deliver core enterprise IT at global scale? 150 locations around the world, 700,000 airmen, uh, that's civilian, total force, guard, reserve, and active duty. Uh, it's a pretty large global issue and challenge. Uh, we have been known to break Microsoft literally at scale. We just recently broke uh, SECM with how we were deploying Windows 10 uh, because we just have so many end devices in so many different configurations that we have to deal with. And so along that line on the cybersecurity front, how do we transform away from this defense in depth model, which is purely, I'll call it the hardened barrier, out, outer layer, if you will, uh, to a much more nodal, uh, much more self-healing, much more agile infrastructure. The next three bubbles there uh, that we'll go through is really all of our workforce transformation. This is no, um, this is no surprise to this audience. We're in a workforce shortage just like the rest of us, or rest of you. A million, I think, is the uh, the current estimate for cybersecurity professionals. We see we're at about a 10% gap with respect to vacancies that we have, and we're doing a lot of initiatives that I'll go through on how we're looking at that. <laughs> And I'm not gonna uh, get on the CIO side for this audience, but certainly a lot of things with respect to uh, what we call the approval process, the risk management process, all those things and how we field systems. How do we make that agile and actually ask the strategic questions and not just become a paperwork process? Uh, I think everybody in the DOD space and certainly the federal space has, has felt some form of that because uh, ultimately I always argue the Chinese love our paperwork pro process, right? It's the, it's the main thing that slows us down from being agile and being responsive. Uh, to defeat the adversary. So when you look specifically on cybersecurity, there's, uh, again, at our scale, one of our number one issues is just basic hygiene. Um, patching and remediating 700,000 devices on our unclassified side, several hundred thousand on the classified side, and then you can go up other classifications from there. So you could argue uh, well over a million endpoints in, in many different configurations from Red Hat to Unix um, to, to regular Windows, XP, yes, they're still around. Um, all those maintenance systems that go through, all the way back in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, uh, of very specific systems built to order all the way up to the here and now. Inter uh, ICBM systems are, are an interesting one, right? Those were, not born, those were not born in the 90s, they were born before then. Um, and so one of our, our key things is the Secretary of Defense is really focused on is just the basic core hygiene and making that repeatable, making it um, cost efficient at scale for a multi-different uh, platform. So the normal things that you hear about, two-factor authentication, um, all of our public-facing applications, uh, we have a large number of them, again, because we're total force. We have a lot of retirees. We have a lot of Guard and Reserve that aren't on an Air Force base. And then ultimately, how do we retool how we secure endpoints? Again, a huge push towards the mobile space, changing the way we do desktop computing, which ultimately changes where the boundaries are to our networks. But what's really more compelling for us, I think, is really what we're doing on the transformational side of it. Uh, we went live, there was a press report a couple months ago on advanced remediation and detection capability. Um, that tool suite gives us extreme visibility that, that we've never had before, literally within a minute. Um, we actually patched remediated several hundred thousand devices of 
some core issues on a ransomware issue that you may be aware of just recently. But we did that literally in actually about 43 minutes across the globe, um, which was unprecedented for us. Typically, that would be multiple days, a couple weeks, if we were able to be successful at all. And we literally got to 99 plus percent uh, accuracy within 43 minutes, which was just game changing. Um, so one was having the inventory and understanding where we were and what we needed to patch, and the other one was actually acting upon those events and, and getting true attribution that we were able to solve the problem. Uh, I'm actually going to go to the third bullet here, which is the joint regional security stacks. Um, this is a part of the defense in depth model, so we're not totally away from that. It is still very much a part of our strategy, um, the layered defense. Why this is different, we have been using what's called the Air Force gateways for years now which was a regional construct and a base construct to provide layer boundary defense, so your proxies and firewalls and all those kind of great tools, but we were doing it specific to the service, specific to the United States Air Force. The, Air Force uh, the Navy was doing it specific to the Navy. And this joint regional security stack framework, really why it's game changing, is because it brings a, a nexus of all that information into the DOD at large. So if you could think of three to four million endpoints, all in this similar ecosystem, providing big data analytics and providing the ability to tip and queue, provide threat intel to other services, to do the normal blocking and tackling all the way up to the advanced techniques, this is really a game changer for us. Uh, so we have been going literally through the globe and regions, deploying, again, it's a, a boundary defense kind of construct with a lot of branches and sequels to it. Uh, but we're about a year away from going fully live across the entire DOD, uh, but when that happens, and we're already seeing the benefits of this, the, the, the impacts on our big data and our, the impacts of global response uh, will really be at, at the tip of our fingers. The, the last one really goes back to our core priorities around our mission systems, right? So the Cyber Resiliency Office was just recently stood up uh, six to eight months ago, really focused on those weapon systems. We had keen issues of, again, I, I would argue the best place to defeat an airframe is not while it's going Mach 3. It's typically when it's parked at the end of the flight line and it's connected into a network or there's a logistic system tied into it, right? That's, that's no surprise. Adversary knows that. So how do, we, how do we ensure all of those mission systems, support systems, again, logistics, maintenance, supply, personnel, all those systems are as hardened as they, they possibly can. So we have what's called the Cyber Resiliency of Weapon Systems Office uh, that was recently stood up, and they are using these tools uh, across all the mission systems to one, again, back to get to, get to back to basics on the cyber hygiene side of it, but then also how do we use things like ARAD, the advanced remediation tools, uh, and, and modernization to progress them farther. The last but not least, this isn't uh, foreign to the uh, industry base, but it's uh, somewhat foreign to the United States Air Force and the federal side, is really the Hack the Air Force. I call them Hack the Star events. We just finished one uh, just recently with Hacker HackerOne, uh, tremendously successful on our public-facing uh, websites. We're going through another uh, aspect of that again here in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, hugely successful, and not just because of what we identified, but how quickly we were able to remediate. Uh, I know this audience knows the remediation speed is absolutely key, and so having the team to look, do deep dives with external crowdsourcing views, uh, we actually went 5 Eye, which to us is folks like the Aussies, uh, the UK, uh, United States, Canadians. We had many different views on our websites and the vulnerabilities that they saw. Um, there was actually a recent article on the, the key hacker was a 17-year-old. Um, we're, we're trying to make phone calls to recruit him, but I think he's, uh, he's, he's well sought after on the commercial side too. But uh, it was 17-year-old, got a, a huge part of the bug bounty for that effort. Um, we're going to do this. We're going to keep doing this. Um, I, I think the realization is there that this is the best way when we can't acquire all the talent that we need, that we can actually uh, crowdsource and force multiply in these areas. The other side of it really is around transformational infrastructure. So it's not just, it is not just an IT discussion any longer. Um, we in the DOD space have been delivering IT as with our own airmen and infantry and soldiers and, and sailors for, for many, many years. And the maturation in the public sector um, with things like FedRAMP, FedRAMP Plus, we are taking to heart. Uh, one of the recent uh, announcements, if you saw just literally within the last week, uh, was an Office 365 and a DOD cloud uh, contract, about a billion dollars worth at our scale uh, or the, or the FIDA or the five-year defense plan. Um, pretty significant. We've already moved 110 users. That talks to scale, right, is being able to deploy a secure, a secure solution 
in an externally uh, commercially provided capability. So we call that cloud hosted enterprise services uh, or the Office 365 is better known. Again, we talked about JRSS uh, and then we're on a larger movement as an Air Force to truly leverage enterprise, what this acronym is for is enterprise IT as a service. So think cloud, think desktop management as a service. Again, using concepts like FedRAMP Plus and those security principles, we believe industry can provide that better, faster, cheaper, and more secure than we're currently providing. Uh, so that's really what we're focused on is how do we deliver, again, at our scale, how do we parse the problem? Uh, we are not necessarily going to look like the Navy's engine model, if you're familiar with that, where it's, a, it's an all-in. It, it will be a phase model, uh, but we, we plan to take things like our cloud movement, our desktop management to aspects, and, and continue to move that to industry. Another big one, and we talked about shared services earlier, uh, but our large enterprise resource planning systems, our logistics systems, financial, uh, and paying personnel, uh, we are also moving to a shared services model, but most importantly within that is a shared security model. So how we do identity management, how do we do security, how do we deep forensics and deep data analytics inside of those systems, uh, things that we aren't very mature on today and we're really trying to, trying to hone in on those areas. Uh, one of the pain points of mine, um, I, it's a little bit challenging from an industry mark, but how do we fundamentally change the way we culturally compute inside the United States Air Force? And what I mean by that is we have thousands and thousands of airmen at the end of the flight line. The last thing they want to do is lug a, a five pound laptop down to the end of the flight line uh, with a wire, right? It's how do you get them a pad, a tablet computing type device, but ultimately it's also about how do I reduce the attack surface, right? That airman on the end of the flight line is as connected to that platform as anyone is in the United States Air Force. And so how do I fundamentally reduce the attack surface of those devices? It also goes into, again, at our scale, the hygiene and be able to maintain and sustain uh, a construct that we deliver. So, right, again, over a million in devices, um, a very complex environment today is very hard to patch or mediate. So how do we simplify that down? And then really the extension, the edge, uh, again, in a very nodal network, not a, a boundary-based network, uh, moving to things like uh, MPLS and cellular networks, again, not rocket science to this group, but it starts to fundamentally change how we operate in the Air Force. And I would contend more securely. Um, you know, 4G, 5G, encrypted networks, how do we layer uh, containerization and container, containerization applications on top of that to provide additional layers of security are definitely things we're going down to provide that, that flatline maintainer their capabilities. Again, workforce, uh, what I'm happy to announce is we've had some very significant invest advancements over the last couple months. Uh, things that I would honestly like to, uh, to both share with you and also get your feedback and what you're doing in industry. Uh, the first one, uh, we had NDA, National Defense Authorization Act uh, language in the last two years to provide more exchanges with industry. So folks like yourselves inside, that's, that's a two-way exchange or a one-way exchange in either direction. Uh, so we are working actively with some industry partners. We would uh, honestly like to have tons of folks in this room engage in. So that's bringing a corporate person into the DOD to help us. Uh, we work through the legal, you know, conflicts of interest type things. Typically, public sector is a, a better person to bring in. But bring that industry thought into how we look at cybersecurity um, in, in our constructs. And so that's an opportunity. The ITEP program is an opportunity for us to bring people out, like an education with industry, and also to bring industry partners in. We're retooling the way we do cybersecurity training. Uh, again, um, I won't go into that one deep here, but the biggest one we're working on right now is changing the way we recruit. No longer the, the recruiting job fairs that we did of the past that you may have seen. I, I joke, but I took my son to Six Flags months and months ago, and the guards there recruiting at Six Flags. And we're retooling that where we're going to Black Hat. We're going to national cyber uh, collegiate competitions. Uh, we're going to where the real talent is. And then what's on top of that is the hiring authorizations that we've gotten, again, from the, the National Defense Authorization Act to directly hire and assess those individuals in. Which is, which is huge and game-changing, right? If you, if you know anything about the civilian hiring process, it's about 180 days to, to onboard a civilian. Um, I, I, as a use case, uh, almost didn't join the Air Force because of that reason. Between the clearance and the hiring process, um, it, it, was a, it was a painful process. And then last but not least, around innovation, uh, we just recently hired a senior executive solely focused on innovation inside the Air Force, specifically in the IT cyber area. So Ms. Lauren Knossenberger just recently joined us. I would urge you to, to reach out to her. 
Um, one of the things she's specifically focused on right now is the flash to bang with respect to a system to, through accreditation and fielding. And so how do we take concepts like cloud computing, the repeatability of FedRAMP Plus, security controls, and start to map those controls where we can literally turn apps on at the speed of the application, not at the speed of the, of the infrastructure. That typically was the, the limiting factor, was the infrastructure. We want to get rid of that 60 to 70% of that process. We've got other initiatives I won't have time for here. Um, if you're not familiar with the Defense Innovation Unit Experimentation um, out in Moffett Field, out in California, it's an inject into Silicon Valley that we're doing. We've got Air Force Digital Services. They actually led the hack the Air Force. Very involved in our security, um, security program. And then the one that I, I, is, is very much out of the norm, so Air Force Academy out in Colorado Springs, uh, one of my old, old towns, uh, has a program called CyberWorks where they're starting to use design thinking in cybersecurity. So how do I not just take it as a technical problem, but how do I look at it from a, a user design perspective? And so we've got deans and faculty and students, uh, cadets, you've seen uh, airmen on the stairs uh, from uh, America's Got Talent, but some of those uh, cybersecurity, computer security smart uh, cadets are helping the deans kind of look at how do we use design thinking inside of cybersecurity. So that's in a nutshell. I don't know if I have time for a question or two, but uh, that'll quickly go through the, the IT and cyber kind of investments that we're doing with respect to the United States Air Force. Time for a couple of questions. You got a couple? All right. It's a shy group. There weren't many last time either. None? Nothing on cloud. I am surprised. I, I, I will say on the cloud side of it, um, people say, how have you moved? So we moved uh, 1.7 million users currently out into a commercial cloud uh, provider. It's actually across town in a, in a large data center complex. They said, how does that impact your cybersecurity posture? Can you trust? And I will tell you this, we just went through an incident. It was an incident, actually. It was a... Um, we were doing the normal scans, normal processes within the FedRAMP pro Plus process. We identified a vulnerability. It was identified to the contractor. It was remediated within two days, and it was fielded within a week. Those are changes in process that we never would have gotten accomplished, honestly, inside the DOD space, right? There's all the challenges from acquisition to contracting to change orders and all those kind of things. Um, those are typically three, six, nine-month efforts, and we were actually able to remediate uh, on our findings, on the vendor's findings, within a couple days. Those are the kind of impacts that we're seeing from cloud. Um, not that it can't, it, it's, it's not vulnerable. It is, everything's vulnerable to some point. It's really about the ability to detect and remediate at scale, at speed for us, that is really the compelling statement. So when you look at Amazon, you look at the Microsoft, you look at the Oracles, um, they honestly have, I think, as much to lose, if not as we do in many cases, because um, the last thing they want to do, that system, that 1.7 million users, is a system called MyPurse, which is every single retired active duty guard reserve civilian uh, from the United States Air Force. So they are very vested, all the way up to the senior executive at, at in this case, Oracle. Um, and so that partnership, as we've talked earlier, it is a strategic partnership between the industry and between the DOD to make sure we can do this right and we can do it at scale and we can do it at the right price. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. Silent crowd. Thanks. Thanks.